Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the 39th annual NOFA Vermont Winter Conference, which is also the kickoff to our year long celebration of our 50th birthday. We're so glad that you're here and we didn't expect it to be like this, but we're so grateful that we can find this way to be together. We hope that while it will be different, it will still be engaging, build community, and be an inspiring month full of learning, connecting, and visioning together for the food and farming system we need for our shared future. We would love it if, um, just to start, you all took a moment to introduce yourself. So if you go over to the chat, if you select all panelists and attendees, if you could put in your name, your farm name, if you're a farmer, wherever you're calling in from, we are so, so glad that you're here with us. I'm gonna see if those start coming in. Sweet. We're so glad you're here. Yes. Good to see you all. My name's Grace O'Dell. I'm the executive director of NOFA Vermont. Over my last year and a half in this role, I've had the great pleasure to connect with many of you in person. For those of you I haven't met yet or who are joining in from afar this year, I'd love to connect. So please say hi in the chat and we'll find a time to get together in person when COVID permits. I'm so humbled and energized by the strength, warm and welcome of this community. I'm grateful every day for, the, for getting to work with you all and learn from you all. It's so good to see all these names coming in. Folks are in Chelsea and Eagles Flight Farm is here. Fernwood Community Garden, welcome, welcome. We've been thinking back on the year since our last winter conference. Whew, what a time we've all been living through. For many of us, last year's conference was the last time we were in a large gathering with others. As a team, we've been talking a lot about how much we're just missing the snack table chat getting to sing together and share meals and the hugging of winter conference. I must say there's really good hugging at the NOFA conference, but we're also really grateful for being able to find these new ways to connect, to tend our connections and our love for each other and to meet new folks, build community. I wanna shout out, there's a lot of new folks registered this year. Over a hundred new people who've never been to the NOFA conference before are with us today. Even if through a computer screen, we're so glad you're all here and we trust we'll be together again soon. If you're new to the conference, welcome. We are so glad to have you. And in fact, I was just thinking we would love it if everyone would drop in the chat how many years you've been coming to the conference. So you can just drop into the chat here. Again, clicking all attendees and panelists and chat away. How many years have you been coming? Nine years. Fourth year, first year, great. 15, longer than 15 years. First year, it's so good to see you all. Awesome, welcome. NOFA Vermont is a membership organization. Our members, so many of you are our heart. You all help us build an agricultural movement that centers people, land, and justice. We're just one small part of that system. There are so many organizations and people and farmers and organizers who gather together to make it happen. Thanks for showing up to be a part of that today. Thank you for being a part of our community. We so appreciate all the support in so many ways that you bring to build our Vermont Ag system that's truly benefiting all living things. If you're not a member, Please, can joining, please consider joining this wonderful crew to strengthen our voice and support our important shared work. Thank you for all the work you're all doing in so many ways already. Given that this conference is largely themed on place, land, and agriculture, we want to begin our time together with an acknowledgement of our place and a colonial land history of the state of Vermont. We, the organizers of the NOFA Vermont Winter Conference, acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Elnu tribe of the Abenaki, Nolhegan Band of the Kusuk Abenaki Nation, Abenaki Nation of Missisquoi, and the Kusuk Traditional Band of the Kus Abenaki Nation, on which we're learning, working, and organizing here today. This land is known by its original and current inhabitants as Nadakina, the Don Land, 
The borders created by non-native governments associated with Vermont, Canada, and the United States are colonial divisions. Therefore, we acknowledge the laws that allow the original peoples and the recognized tribes in this colonial state to pursue their culture does not ensure full tribal access in their own native homeland. We think it's important to make this land acknowledgement because our mission invites us all to consider how we relate to steward and live on the land we know as Vermont to promote an economically viable and ecologically sound and socially just food system for current and future generations. In honor and respect, we invite you who are gathering at this conference to deepen our shared understanding of the ongoing process of colonialism and its continuous impact on our work together. We ask that we each of us commit ourselves to decolonizing our ways of thinking, behaving, relating to the land and the design of legal structures so that we can repair relationships with native communities in the land and support reconciliation efforts among all people and ensure the inclusion of the Abenaki nation. I'd like to share some tangible ways you can learn from indigenous leaders throughout this conference in commitment to our goal. In just a few minutes, you'll be hearing from Sherry Mitchell, a Native American leader and land activist who was raised on the Penobscot Indian Reservation. I'll share more about Sherry shortly. The Abenaki Land Link Project will be featured in our community food access panel on the 17th. All conference attendees will have the opportunity to stream the film Gather, a fight to revitalize our native food ways from home all month long. Tune in for a question and answer discussion with the filmmaker and panel of leaders, activists, chefs, and scientists featured in the film on Monday, February 22nd from 6.30 to 8 p.m. There are several workshops and roundtables that are also aimed at helping us develop a better understanding of justice and how race, class, power, and privilege are all at play in agriculture right here in Vermont. We hope that this conference offers a moment to engage meaningfully in deep thinking about our role in these structures and how we can move forward towards a more just world. This month, please consider attending some of these workshops and roundtables we're offering, including Advancing BIPOC Land Access in Nadakina, that's led by leaders from the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, the Everytown Project, Vermont Land Trust, Vital Communities, and NOFA Vermont a panel on the cows don't milk themselves on milk with dignity and farm worker rights in the time of COVID by migrant justice leaders, participatory capacity building for an inclusive organic movement by A. Day Briones of First Nations Development Institute and Jennifer Taylor of the Organic Farming Association, Lola's Organic Farm, and our community food access growing from each for each other panel from leaders from all over our state. We encourage you to attend these opportunities and more as a crucial piece of understanding this place we all call home. Finally, this conference would not be possible without the support of our sponsors, whose information you can browse on our website. We invite you to check out their, their profiles and send them some love. This event is our biggest fundraiser of the year and sponsors help make it successful. So please, please love on them. We couldn't do it without you. We especially want to call out our cultivator, nourisher, and nurturer level sponsors, Meadows Bee Farm, The Alchemist, City Market, Johnson Family Foundation, the Lintelac Foundation, The Latner Foundation, King Arthur Baking Company, Lawson's Finest Liquids, Stonyfield, Vermont Family Farms, and our media sponsor, Seven Days. Thanks to these top sponsors and all the sponsors who made this conference possible. In addition to the sponsors, I want to thank the other contributors who pulled together to make this conference happen. The NOFA board and staff, of course, but also our volunteers who work tirelessly behind the scenes every year, presenters this year coming from all over the country, and all of you for participating. It would not be possible without all of you. Thank you for being here. If you have any logistical questions during this month, it's a different format. We're all learning it. Please be patient with us and with yourself if there are glitches. You can reach out to Livy, our wonderful winter conference coordinator this year at Livy, L-I-V-Y, at nofavt.org. We'll also be sending out a giant email every week of the conference that has Zoom links for workshops and details about the upcoming week. You can check out details in advance at nofavt.org slash conference. Registration is rolling for the whole month. Um, so feel free to invite a friend and spread the word with your community. Thanks so much for showing up to be a part of this year's wonky, but hopefully still wonderful winter conference despite its change format. We're so, so glad you're here. And we're hoping we'll be together again soon. 
Now I'd like to welcome our board chair, Peter Forbes, to the stage, who's going to be giving the Spirit of Enid Wanakot Award. I'd like to share a bit of background. We established this award last year as a way to acknowledge the beloved Enid Wanakot, the former executive director of NOFA Vermont, who passed away two years ago. Enid led this community with grace, joy, playfulness, love, and vision for 30 years. She is sorely missed. I didn't have the privilege of knowing Enid personally, but as I've continued to be deeply immersed in this community and the work she helped grow over 30 years, I feel I'm coming to know her. In her honor last year, we started a Spirit of Enid Awanakot Award to remember her community building, joyful spirit, and long-term commitment to Vermont agriculture. This inaug the inaugural year, we celebrated Andy Jones, Suzanne Long, Jennifer Blackwell, and Bonnie Acker. And I'm now going to welcome Peter Forbes, who's our board chair, to give this year's award. And then we'll come back together to continue the tradition of singing together. And surely Enid's spirit will be with us. Mm -hmm. Peter? Good afternoon, everyone. Well, as this may be wonky it, it, to use Grace's terms, but my heart is pounding. And I am so uh, grateful, really, to be connected with so many wonderful growers and farmers and other good souls from all over Vermont uh, on, this, on this snowy day. And, and to have the honor really of, of some time with Sherry Mitchell. Thank you so much, Sherry, who you'll, you'll hear from in a little bit. In this moment, uh, we are all connected by an appreciation, of course, of the great value of, of healthy soils and, and the promise really they offer for healthy people and an inclusive community, that's, that's all what Enid stood for. And one of the things that makes a beloved community an inclusive community is our capacity to honor our elders. And in this moment, I feel the loss of uh, two very, very important people to our movement. Of course, Enid, um, who, we're, who we're honoring today uh, with this, this named award of her, but also Jack Laser, one of the people we're honoring today who passed away uh, last November 30th. The purpose of this award is to remember that beautiful person you see on the screen and to bring Enid's spirit right to the surface of our lives every year by honoring those who truly uh, embody uh, her spirit daily. Now I wanna begin uh, with Jack and Ann Laser, innovators of organic agriculture, co-founders of Butterworks Farms in the Northeast Kingdom. From that hilltop in Northern Vermont, these two really have changed our state and our country. Jack and Ann have always been a powerful team. They moved to that hilltop 45 years ago and started making yogurt and, and cottage cheese prepared on their cook stove and doing door-to-door uh, -door delivery. And today, well, I think most of us know what it is today. <laughs> we have exceptional quality products, all from those pastures, um, yogurts, heavy creams, buttermilks, widely available all across uh, the Northeast. And you and Jack did that. And that would be an exceptional uh, success alone in any lifetime, but there's been so much more to their lives. Jack knew uh, the particulars of soil, but also how to elevate every con conversation to the, the larger level of, uh, of universal human need. I mean, pasture was Jack's passion, but so was fixing tractors with his friend Brian Dunn, or reading Wendell Berry's poetry, or writing his own book. Jack Laser was an exceptional scholar, a persistent and optimistic farmer, and a remarkably generous human being. One of the people you felt would drop anything if you asked him to have a conversation. So many of us, many of us across this state, and I bet many of us on this this call right now have had those kind of conversations with Jack. Stonyfield Yogurt and Ann have created a farmer trainer program, a soil health stewards to honor Jack's ideas and spirit of mentorship. 
I want to say something too about um, if you look at those two, that photograph there of Jack and, and Anne, I want to say something too about the model of their partnership. Jack and Anne accomplished so much together. They built a business and supported each other's ideas. And then Jack, Anne cared for Jack through seven years of dialysis, all while keeping their farm and family going. Jack and Anne were honored in 2019 with a Vermont Agricultural Hall of Fame Lifetime Achievement Award for advocating for our world, you know, our, our collective work of organic agriculture. Their 100% grass-fed products are in yogurt, their corn is in whiskey, and their lessons are deep in our movement. And I think Anne is on, and I hope maybe she might have a few words for us, if that's true. <laughs> Anne, are you able to? You go. I was having trouble getting it unmuted. <laughs> I, I thought so much. You're all ready to go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Peter, for the wonderful tribute you gave to Jack and me. And and uh, he's definitely a, a, a hole in the works these days. So <laughs> we're getting along without him. We've got a wonderful general manager now, and our family is right in there in the thick of it, working really hard to uh, support all what he got started and... Um, support me too. I mean, you're not, I'm not milking cows now and I've got my own little flock of chickens and ducks and things like that. But, um, and I'm, I'm still dreaming new dreams and trying out new things and stuff like that um, in the spirit of what we did together. Um, but we'll always miss both Enid and Jack for their amazing, engaging personalities. And I think they had that in common and they were really good friends that way. And, um, and their optimism and positive attitudes about how anything could happen and they could make everything work and the passion that they both had. And uh, we'll all remember Enid for hugs and Jack wasn't too bad at it either. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but yeah, it's, um, it's been quite a ride with, uh, with Jack and, and we'll, you know, we're always grateful for what Enid did. She was such a, amazing force to get this organic farmers group to where it is now. And she never took the USDA for granted and always questioned, you know, whether it was where we should have gone and what we should have done, but we didn't really have a lot of choice. So um, it's been, it's been great. I really appreciate, and I feel really humbled by this award. It's really been an um, amazing experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. It's great to, great to see you too. Today, we're also honoring Scout Prof. Mother, farmer, teacher, Scout Cares for Sunday Farm in East Dorset, Vermont's longest running CSA, which Scout started in 1987. And they've been community driven ever since. Their hillside farm has earned so much respect from all across New England for how they farm, but the consistent way in which they've served community for decades, upon decades, really. If you spend time in that part of Vermont, Someday Farm has likely helped to make you. They've raised thousands of game birds and roasted chickens and turkey in their own state certified processing facility. They've innovated countless new ways of doing community supported agriculture. And, and somehow, they also, on top of all of that, propagate over a hundred varieties of organic vegetables and fruits. We honor Scout Prof not because of the energy and care she's given to Someday Farm, but also because of how she shared her, herself with so many generations of Vermont farmers. Scout's generosity of spirit has made our NOFA community so much stronger. Unfortunately, Scout, we can't beam Scout to you this afternoon, but please uh, take in her words. These are her words. This recognition is a reminder to, to keep planting seeds and nurturing the folks 
who watch the seeds grow in these times is of the utmost importance to mentor others as Enid did and to show kindness to all things growing as Enid did and to spread the inclusiveness of what NOFA stands for as Enid did. Kindness and joy and heartful, heartful work Thank you, Enid, for reminding us all in what is really of greatest importance. And thank you, Jack and Ann Laser and Scout Prof for modeling Enid, Enid's life for all of us. Thank you so much, Peter. Next, we're going to welcome Ronnie Arbo to sing We Shall Be Known before we welcome our keynote speaker today. This is a song that Enid selected as our winter conference song two years ago, and we've now made it a tradition of singing it every year. So thank you so much to Ronnie and her crew singing this for us today. And if y'all know the song, we would love to have you sing along. Feel free to um, just belt it out. You're in your home, do what, you, do what makes you comfortable. So here we go, Ronnie, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Great, please join us. This is a beautiful song by Ma Muse that raises up resilience, health, um, strength, and the way that we find those things in community. We had the great pleasure of being able to sing this for Enid in person and also at her memorial. So we send it out to her spirit and to all of you in the ways that NOFA brings people together in this incredible community. Um, so from our COVID pod to yours, we shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds that change the life from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive it is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep by the ones who circle around to lend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change the life from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in great turning we shall learn to lead in love in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love Thank you so much for that. That was beautiful. 
That is the magic. Thank you so much. I hope you're taking in these, these comments in the chat. Folks are really, really appreciating all of this beauty. It's really helping us land here together. Thank you. We're here now, I think. I think the conference is beginning and it's time for our keynote. We're delighted to start this conference today, welcoming Sherry Mitchell. We're grateful to have joining us to speak on indigenous wisdom for living spirit-based change. Sherry Mitchell Wana Hamukwaset is a Native American attorney, teacher, activist, and change maker who grew up on the Penobscot Indian Reservation. She's a land lawyer and the author of Sacred Instructions, Indigenous Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change, as well as the convener of the Global Healing Ceremony, Healing the Wounds of Turtle Island. She's the founding director of the Land Peace Foundation, an organization dedicated to the protection of indigenous land, water, and religious rights, and the preservation of the indigenous way of life. Sherry works at the intersection between indigenous rights, climate change, and human evolution. She, she's an alumna of the American Indian Ambassador Program and the Udall Native American Congressional Internship Program. She is the recipient of the Mahoney Dunn International Human Rights and Humanitarian Award, the Spirit of Maine Award for International Human Rights, and the Peace and Justice Center's Hands of Peace Award. Sherry has been a longtime advisor to the American Indian Institute's traditional circle of Indian elders and youth and coordinated programs for their Healing the Future program. She's also served as an advisor to the Indigenous Elders and Medicine People's Council of North and South America for the last 20 years. She's a consultant and advisory committee member for Neotero's Indigen International Indigenous Land Guardianship Program. Sherry's prescient book has lived on my bedside table this year. Her words have really helped me find grounding and steadiness in these very challenging times. In one passage, Sherry writes, when our children and grandchildren look us in the eye in years to come, they will ask us these questions. When that moment comes, this is how we are going to want to respond. We woke up, we showed up, we stood up. We did what we had to do to protect your right to exist. We did everything that we could to protect the animals, the land and the waters, and to ensure that Mother Earth was given the right to live with all of her biodiversity intact. We did everything within our power to ensure that you would not only survive, but have the ability to thrive. We stood up for you in the same way that our ancestors stood up for us. I am so ready to listen to Sherry today and so grateful that she is able to be here with us. I want to share a logistical note that we will have time for questions at the end of Sherry's presentation, but we ask that you add your questions in the Q&A box throughout. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A, and if you click in there, you can add a question and we'll read them to Sherry at the end of our time together. So in gratitude, thank you, Sherry. I'm going to pass it over to you to speak to us today. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Grace, uh, for that really beautiful introduction. Uh, thank you to the uh, family pod for the incredible song, to Peter for the remembrances of those who have been leading the way and uh, illuminating the path along the way. I think that it's, it's so important uh, to acknowledge those who have come before us. So. I want to start out by introducing myself to you in my language and acknowledgement of my family and my relatives and where I come from. And Dali we see one of the Hamukwasit and Najio Banawabskewi, Pasilda and Dona Bamukawasus, Noa Banawabskewi, Nagakaka Gus Nilti Bayek. My name and my language, as Grace said, is one of Hamukwasit. I am from the Penobscot Nation. My family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy tribe at Zabayak. And um, I am certainly nurtured by the sacrifices of those who have gone before me. And uh, what I want to talk about today is about 
kinship. I want to talk about how um, we come together in uh, concentric ways that we oftentimes are not even aware of and how the kinship relationships that we have beyond our family of origin, our family of birth, uh, are oftentimes the ones that are the most nourishing to our bodies and to our spirits. Um, and that we have this kinship relationship also with the land that needs our love and our, our uh, gratitude and our care. So I've been thinking a lot about kinship. I um, have recently reacquired uh, 200 acres of land in my traditional uh, territory and am, am building community here. Uh, and the name of the community is Wajukum Toltina Kinship Community. And so Wajukum Toltina is based on um, principles of uh, this way of life that we call Skijinawe Bamosawagan. And that is a way of life lived in harmony with the rest of creation. And so when I think about uh, Wajukum Toltina, which means let's help one another. Uh, and I think about that in terms of kinship uh, I have to really contemplate all the ways that uh, my life has been supported, not only by those who have come before me, but by the land herself, by mother earth herself. And I have to think about the ways that um, mother earth is tied to all of our stories that help us frame our understanding of our relationship with who we are and where we come from. In one of our creation stories, uh, we are told that uh, Guzgabe, who is uh, the man from nothing, the man from the space of all possibility, uh, the one who tells the truth, and according to missionaries and colonial scholars, he's, he's, the, he's the great liar. Um, but in our traditions, uh, Guzgabe is... Uh, is the one who helps us to understand our relationship with the rest of life. And so in this particular story, what we're told is that uh, we are born when, or we emerge into this, into this land, not we are born, but we emerge into this land when uh, Gluskop shoots an arrow into an ash tree and the ash tree splits and we emerge from beneath its roots up through the ash tree onto the land at what, um, for uh, all Wabanaki people, so in Chikwabanaki, uh, and that, um, that that story is, is not telling us that we are literally born of an ash tree. It's telling us that our lives are deeply connected to um, all other life, because we have a number of other stories that talk about our uh, origin of species our arrival here on Mother Earth during this lifetime uh, in, in a number of different ways. And all of these stories teach us a different aspect of our being and teach us different things about our relationships with one another and with the rest of creation. And so that particular story teaches us how we're woven together with the rest of life. And in honor of that teaching and that relationship, Chikwabanaki uh, people have have been weaving their baskets from the ash tree for centuries. And uh, when we weave those baskets together, we're acknowledging that deep connection that we have, how our lives are woven together with the elements of the natural world. And it's a reminder to us uh, not to forget our place within creation. And this story has been incredibly meaningful to me at this time uh, because of where we are in regard to COVID. And so we're, we're in this very interesting time. There's a, a story that I've been telling a lot during this time, and some of you may have heard it in different forms, and uh, I apologize if you, if you don't want to hear it again, but I'm going to repeat an abbreviated version of it here uh, today. Uh, and this story is a very, very old story, and it reminds me of something that one of uh, one of the clan mothers from up at uh, uh, First Nation and Tobik, uh, uh, Willista community used to say every time she was going to tell a story. And, and now other people from that community 
always quote her when they're telling their stories. And one of them is my friend, um, uh, Ron, who's the grand chief of the Willistic First Nation. And, um, and so she used to say uh, in the language before she would tell a story, uh, this isn't a story, this really happened. And uh, what she meant by that is that we know that uh, all of the things that we're experiencing right now are things that we've experienced before because our stories tell us that this is the fourth time that we've come here. Uh, they, they tell us that we've gone through all of these things before and that each time we grow a little bit more than, than we had in the, in the previous time that we were here and uh, we're trying to move ourselves, we're trying to level up in gamer speak. Uh, we're trying to level up to the next world here. And, um, you know, now I've, I've really been contemplating, are we going to be able to do that? And so this story uh, that has been on my mind so much is the story of the first illness. And in this story of the first illness, the animals who are distraught over the behavior of the children of the earth, that's us human beings, we're the youngest species on the planet. So we are the, considered to be the children. They're very concerned with our behavior because we've started to forget our place within creation. Uh, we're listening more to the voice of our ego than we are the voice of creation. We're listening more to our ego than we are to the voices of the animals or the plants or the trees. Uh, we're listening to our ego more than we're listening to the sound of the wind or the waters. And because we're listening to, to that voice of our ego, we're beginning to falsely elevate ourselves within um, the scheme of creation. And in doing so, we've taken on behaviors that have begun to harm the rest of life. And uh, the animals are, are really contemplating what is it that we need to do for these children in order to help them find their way back home, find their way back into harmonious balance with the rest of life. And what the animals decide after much deliberation and a great deal of uh, emotional distress because they love us. They, they are the ones who made the way for us to be here, to have life here on earth. Um, and they came before us to pave the way to allow us to be part of this beautiful creation. And so they're not happy about having to make this choice. Uh, so the animals decide that they're going to give us illness. And they're going to give us an illness that is not easily um, cured with the medicine of man. And uh, that, um, you know, this, is, this might be the only way that we uh, understand how interconnected we are with the rest of the natural world uh, because the only medicines that will heal us will be the medicines of the plants and the trees. And so the animals give us illness, okay? So we're, we're right now in 2020, 2021, we're experiencing uh, illness that was given to us by the animals. And so in the story, um, which, you know, is an old story that, you know, is told to my grandmother by her grandmother who learned it from her grandmother going back um, for as long as, as there is memory. And uh, in the story, um, after watching the human beings suffer with this illness for quite a long time and seeing them losing so many of their, their loved ones, uh, the plants and the trees are watching and they're, and they're starting to take pity on the humans. And so they, they go into council together and they say, what can we do to help these children without taking away the lesson that the animals have given to them? And so they decide that, you know, the purpose of this lesson is to get human beings to come back into harmonious balance with the rest of life uh, because they've forgotten the language of creation, they've forgotten the language of the animals, they've forgotten the language of the waters, they've forgotten the language of the trees and the plants. So they decide that if they float out a message to the human beings uh, and invite them to come back into relationship with the plants and the trees, uh, if, if they will come back and if they will begin to um, ask them humbly uh, for the medicine that will heal them, then uh, the plants and the trees will help them and they'll give them that medicine. 
And so they, they took um, that, that teaching, they took that invitation and they uh, sent it out on the wind into the dream time for the human beings. And it went into the dreams of the human beings. And then uh, there was a grandmother who, who caught that message and uh, in that dream. And she remembered a time when she was a young girl uh, when the elders used to talk about uh, uh, talking with the plants. And so she is, you know, uh, very much in pain over the suffering of her people. And so she, she uh, goes into the forest and she begins to just talk to the trees and, and talk to the plants. And, um, you know, she has this sincerity in her heart because she knows that this is, uh, that this is the truth that's come to her. And uh, after a while, the plants and trees are watching her. She's making offerings. Uh, she's, you know, singing for the plants. She's uh, doing ceremony for the plants. Um, she's talking to them as though they were family, so they were kin. Uh, and they see that sincerity in her heart, so they begin to communicate back with her. And over time, they tell her the medicines that will help her people. And they explain to her the proper protocols for harvesting those medicines and preparing them. And then they explain to her how she's to dose her people. And, and then they, they tell her that, you know, she must never again forget her relationship with the rest of life, her and her people. And so she goes back and she helps to make her people well. And uh, once they're well, she explains to them how she found the medicine uh, and, you know, they share this information with others. Some of them take it, some of them don't. Uh, and so what we're told in our teachings is that uh, it was our, our, our group of humans um, who were the ones who returned to a balanced way of life with the rest of creation. And that those who didn't return to that balanced way of life eventually went extinct. And so at the heart of that balanced way of life for us as a people is to be in kinship with one another, but then to extend that kinship to the rest of creation and to recognize that, that we sit in balanced counsel with the animals. We sit in balanced counsel with the plants and the trees, with the waters and the winds, uh, you know, with our relatives in the winged nations and those who crawl beneath the earth. And that when we forget our place within uh, that creation, then we start to move in ways as a species that threaten not only our existence upon the earth, but the existence of all other living beings, because we're all connected in this deep, balanced way. And so uh, I've been thinking a lot about that. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, nourishment. One of my friends uh, said to me uh, a couple of years ago that, that the thing that struck him uh, the most was that um, we, you know, we recognize our connection to Mother Earth. We recognize that we're uh, in cycles of reciprocity with the rest of life. Um, yet the way that our society has developed uh, has, has been in such a way that we don't even return our bodies uh, to the Earth in a way that's not toxic. And so we, you know, when we die, we don't give our bodies back to the earth for it to become the nourishment for those who will come after us, right? We, we pump our bodies full of toxins in the form of embalming fluids. Uh, and then we burn ourselves with chemicals uh, or we put ourselves into a, a thick chemically treated box and then put that thick chemically treated box into a cement box in the ground so that our bodies don't even go back uh, into the earth. And so we are, we've disrupted in so many ways this reciprocity and this process of reciprocity that we're meant to be engaged with, with life. And so uh, when we're thinking about the ways that we are nourished, how are our bodies nourished? How are, um, our, how are our emotional bodies nourished? How are our spirits nourished? We have to think about that foundational relationship with Mother Earth and how Mother Earth nourishes us. 
uh, how our umbilical connection, you know, when we enter into this, into this universe, we enter into our first ecosystem, which is our mother's womb. Uh, and in that ecosystem, we're nourished by our connection through our umbilical cord to our birth mother. But then when we're born into this world, uh, our umbilical connection is transferred to the earth mother. And then the earth mother nourishes us for the rest of our lives. Um, but there's no reciprocity um, happening on a large scale to cultivate and to maintain that relationship with life. And I just think that it's really important for us as we think about our um, connection to the land to think about the ways that uh, that connection has been disrupted. Um, you know, not just with embalming fluids and, uh, you know, all of this capitalist greed and uh, industrial pollution, but what are the ways that we're blocking our own nourishment uh, emotionally and, and in, in regard to the ways that we engage our relationship with Mother Earth? How are we engaging the elements of our homes? I'm, I'm living in this farmhouse now uh, on this land at Wajukum Doltina and um, all of the bones of this house that I'm living in, in the huge barn that's across the driveway, uh, have all come from trees that have lived on this land for hundreds of years. And so as I'm, you know, offering prayers for the land and for what we'll build here, I'm also recognizing the living aspects of this house. Um, I'm recognizing the living aspects of that barn and that the elements that make up those structures have had place here for hundreds of years. And uh, I'm recognizing that the disruption of 200 years from this land being taken from my ancestors and, and handed out in land grants, uh, that 200 year period is a blip um, in the larger scheme of life. And that when we came here, we knew this was the right place because when we walked upon this land and we uh, put tobacco down and we offered prayers here, uh, we felt the land lift up and listen to us speaking in our language. And we knew that the land here uh, had been left uh, alone, largely. Um, but more importantly, we knew that the land here recognized our voices. And that would give us an opportunity to have a relationship here with the land um, that was the kind of relationship that we were looking for. And so when we're, when we're engaged in land-based projects, when we're engaged in building, when we're engaged in growing, um, how we view that relationship with what we're uh, cultivating, how we build that relationship with what we're growing, how we understand our place within that process, um, and how we view ourselves in regard to being part of a balance uh, with the rest of creation is critical to what ends up happening uh, to the things that we grow or the things that we build. Uh, it determines, the found, that foundation determines the life, just as the foundation of uh, a child who was denied emotional nourishment uh, can manifest in an adult who is not able to receive nourishment into their physical body. Uh, if we aren't conscious of, of how we're cultivating our relationship with the land and with what we grow, uh, then, then what we're putting forward is not going to cultivate and nurture the type of leaders that we're going to need to bring us forward into the future. But it's also not going to cultivate uh, the nourishing elements of the soil. Uh, the nutrient density in the soil is going to continue to be diminished as our relationship is further diminished from the land. And so as we move back to the land, we have to move back uh, with that in mind, to recognize the correlation between the depletion of the nutrients in the soil and the depletion of the nutrients of our own souls that's connected to our uh, separation from the land. And so those are the things that I would uh, really like to contemplate with you today as, as we're um, moving through this very interesting time together where we're being given this opportunity to really think about 
um, what does it mean to be in relationship? We are really being asked to sit back and to think about what does it mean to be in relationship? And we're being separated from one another as human beings as we're being asked to contemplate that question. And so what greater time do we have to contemplate our relationship with the earth? Uh, what greater time do we have to really think about uh, our, our life source and our nourishment coming from the land and to really begin to deepen our roots back into Mother Earth uh, so that we are once again having this, you know, mutually beneficial reciprocal relationship with the rest of life. And that as we reinstitute, reconstitute, uh, those, those roots and that umbilical connection uh, that we're going to see not only ourselves nourished uh, in body and spirit, but we're also going to start to see that nourishment showing up in the earth again. And so uh, I hope that as you go forward in whatever work that you're doing together throughout this time um, that you're gathering through this conference, that um, you will think about that. You'll think about uh, what does it mean for me during this time, as I'm contemplating my steps forward um, during COVID and, and, you know, uh, and I don't think we'll ever be post COVID, but uh, as we move forward uh, in a different relationship with COVID, uh, how do we think about the mutuality of our being in relationship to the realities that we're seeing upon the earth? And so uh, now with the rest of the time that we have, I would love to have a conversation with you uh, about maybe some of those things or, or any other questions that you have. And for now, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna just say, uh, Basilda and Dilma Bamuk, I offer these words for, for all of my relations. Thank you very much. I'm happy, Grace, now to take any questions. Okay, thank you so much for that, Sherry. We do have some questions here coming in um, and I'm gonna try to get through as many as we can. One, one person is saying, you know, offering a lot of gratitude for the teaching you've shared and is asking, where do you see good opportunities to get humans into the right humble relationship with the rest of life that you're talking about when so many powerful forces seem determined that that not be? Where are you finding hope or seeing possibility? I mean, the back to the land movement that's happening right now can't be denied. There are so many people who are moving back into relationship with the land. Uh, people are buying up large tracts of land and um, building community, living in community with one another, um, figuring out what that means, you know, trying to use the land as a basis or the land back movement uh, as a basis for um, reparations for harms that have been done. Uh, not only to the human populations, but to all of the living beings who have been in the pathway of that violence and destruction. And so uh, all of the things that are, I'm hopeful about are centered around relationships with land. Uh, and uh, to me, that's the most encouraging thing that I've, that I, that I've seen. Um, and ways that people who are large landowners in traditional indigenous territories are uh, figuring out ways to work with the local indigenous populations, especially those who are landless in their own homelands um, and providing space for them to um, once again, have relationship with the lands um, that were taken from them. And I think that that's just, uh, you know, like I said, all of those things are really deeply connected to the land. And so when we look at the land as uh, not only the source of our survival, but now being the impetus for our reconciliations and reparations, then we really start to begin to, you know, shift away from this view that uh, the term Mother Earth is metaphorical, right? We start to really start looking at the earth as a living being who is interceding on our behalf despite all the harm that we've caused to her. And to me, that's just incredibly beautiful and very hopeful. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
We have another question here um, calling out how much of that ego elevation or separation is a product of the Western creation story or the Western way that humans are above and apart from other creatures. How might we change that? It feels like we've all been soaking in that for so long. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, when I, one of the things that a lot of people have heard me say um, is that uh, I, I think that, you know, the important thing I, I tease friends of mine who come to visit, we walk in the woods or we paddle on the river. And I say, geez, you notice how the eagles are flying right over us and calling. You notice how the animals have not stopped talking to one another or moving about here in the forest when we're walking through here. And uh, they'll be like, wow, yeah, I, geez, I hadn't noticed that. But yeah, that's, that's really something. Usually it goes quiet when I go in the woods. And I, you know, jokingly say, well, that's because we were never kicked out of the garden, right? Um, but I think that that's, that's an important point of demarcation, right? Uh, so when we think about elevation and othering, uh, you know, it's like, it's like a reading comprehension test, right? And so uh, when I look at the story and I use my reading comprehension skills, uh, what I see is not uh, a story that has women being, uh, you know, uh, at the root of sin because they ate an apple. What I see is this um, belief in othering being the real lesson. This is the place where this uh, notion of separation first began to poison the minds of, of human beings. Uh, this is the place where uh, human beings started seeing themselves as something other than the rest of the beings within the garden, right, within the natural world. And it was that point of separation, that point of demarcation of othering uh, that began all of the tragedy that has um, spiraled out beyond the creation of that story. That it's a, you know, that was a cautionary tale about our belief in separation that got somehow distorted over time to be a completely different story that served a completely different purpose. And so uh, I think that, you know, we've been steeped in that story for a very long time, you know, uh, and uh, certainly longer than, um, you know, this contemporary Western thought. Um, however, I think that that is the seed that it all goes back to and everything that has grown out of that seed and all of the branches of it have led to um, what I consider to be distortions of thought. And that the only way that we're going to really be able to undo that distortion of thought is to go back to that very point of demarcation and go back to this belief in othering this belief in separation, and then all of the false hierarchies that have been built and created off from that one flawed belief. And then you can begin to slowly dismantle and unravel um, all of the, all of the um, spiritual illness and mental distortions that have um, been created since that time. I, you know, I think that, that that's the place where we begin is we have to begin uh, at the very place where we went off the track, right? We have to go back to the place where we left the map in order to find our way. And so where did we leave the trail, right? Uh, we left the trail when we started seeing ourselves as something other, as separate. And that's where we need to begin again is to really eradicate that, that belief from our minds. Thanks for that. Related, um, I'm seeing a couple of questions that I think are related to each other. One person is asking if you could share about your favorite plants to grow as well as your how you communicate or connect with them. Another person is asking um, your thoughts on crops that would best connect to the indigenous uh, agricultural history and here on this land in, in Vermont and New England, if you have any thoughts on both of those questions that feel somewhat connected. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there are probably people, like there's a woman named Karen Martin who has done a lot. Um, there's another woman who's um, at the Passamaquoddy community at Zubayak who has um, done a ton of work. Um, and I can, what I can do is I can email some names and, and email addresses if I can get their permission um, to talk about specific crops. Um, and so, uh, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> I think there was a question about how, how you connect and communicate with the plants that you're growing. Well, I think that, you know, there are so many things that we know how to do already. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and part of the problem is what are you using for seed? What are you using for soil? And so, um, one of the most beautiful things that, that I was taught about plants actually came from, uh, you know, a Japanese organic farmer who was the father of kind of the modern organics movement, um, Fukuoka, who just, uh, you know, walked away from this life of being a chemical engineer and became an organic farmer because he almost died. Um, from things that he came in contact with. And so, uh, you know, we had, we had really been, uh, we're hunter and gatherer population, right? And so this, there was some agricultural practices, um, but I think that those things came later. Um, and uh, for me, uh, you know, being able to be ensured that the seeds that I'm holding in my hand are really truly organic uh, so that I can put them in my mouth and let them interact with my saliva before I put them in the ground, right? So that they have, they're getting informed by my um, biology, how best to formulate themselves, right? And then walking barefoot every day through your crops uh, talking to them, singing to them, um, and, and helping them to form a relationship with you in a deeply biological way. Uh, and when we do that, uh, I remember I got, a, I got an email from somebody today, not today, uh, in the last month, um, who had heard me speak a long time ago and heard me talking about, you know, this kind of thing and that um, you know, if we're in relationship, like I walk on the earth barefoot all the time, you know, when I'm home every single day, it doesn't matter. It's snowing out right now. And I walked outside barefoot this morning um, to get my bare feet on the earth here. Right. But if we're, if we're connecting with the land around us, then when we're sick, the medicines we need will naturally grow up in in our environment. Like I moved into this place and, uh, you know, I hadn't been walking around here barefoot. Right. Uh, but I've been walking upon the earth barefoot and the earth is all connected. And so I, I get here, I get in this place. And then, uh, a short time later, I learned that the medicine that I need, which is not a native indigenous plant, right. It's not indigenous to this territory, uh, is somehow growing in the backyard right? Somebody clearly planted it there, but it's the very medicine that I needed. And within a month of when I moved into this place. And so um, when we have relationships like that with the land and we are putting our trust in the land, but also, you know, communicating with the land and giving it the, op the information that it needs to continue to provide us with what uh, we need to be strong and healthy, we're also, you know, uh, becoming more and more mindful of what the land needs to be healthy, what the land needs to be operating at its optimal level so that it can interpret those signals from us, right? And so it changes the relationship that we have with the land when we start to really think about it that way and understand its capacity and, uh, you know, in turn, our capacity to communicate with and have relationship with us. Uh, it shifts, it shifts things for us. Um, and uh, I'm coordinating with a couple of other um, 
people, uh, groups in the area in regard to what I'm growing here. And so we're all growing different things that are part of our um, traditional diet, but also part of our traditional ceremonial medicines and part of our traditional uh, medicines for our bodies. So, um, yeah, I mean, it just, I, I think that uh, when we, when we really start doing that, cause I, I took my cue from, from those teachings. Um, and then over time, having entered into the door, uh, when, you know, when you enter into that realm of understanding, then the land itself begins to teach you. And anybody that works with the land is going to have that same story that once you really get connected to it, then the land itself begins to teach you and things just, you know, come out of nowhere. And, um, and over time you realize, you know, just like I'm talking about this reparations work, uh, rematriation work, that this is all connected um, to the land rising up and calling for healing. And, uh, you know, that's profound when we really have that understanding of the, of the depths of that communication that's going on. Thank you for that, Jerry. Uh, an, another question about our relationship to land, and this person is really calling on, you know, how do you see those of us who work as farmers in our role in this healing with land and healing with plant community as we as we grow food on the land and feed our communities. Could you speak to sort of some practices or, or how farmers might approach this work? I'm not a farmer. And so, um, you know, I, I think that uh, everything that I've just said is really the same answer to that question that, um, you know, you have to be really conscious about the land being, uh, you know, alive. You have to be conscious of the fact that uh, this living being uh, also has needs of her own that, you know, that the land is not simply there as a resource to be exploited, um, that uh, there is a, a deeply symbiotic relationship between us and the land. We can't get well until the land is well and the land can't get well until we are well. Uh, our healing is tied to one another in really deep ways. And so when, when we have that understanding, then, you know, just the ways that we work with the land, um, the ways that we cultivate what we're feeding people with, uh, what we put into the soil, you know, are we putting things into the soil that are going to harm the soil? Uh, are we going to put pesticides into the soil that are going to create desertification, right? Probably not in this group, but, um, you know, how are we how are we looking at the land and how are we thinking of the land? Do we think about the land in commodified ways or do we think about the land as a living source of our survival? And so, um, you know, I think that it's really a spiritual mindset. It's really about understanding uh, in a really deep scientific way all of the ways that we're entangled with one another uh, and with the rest of the living beings upon Mother Earth and with Mother Earth herself. And that translates into how we conduct our business as, you know, as farmers, how we conduct our business uh, as, um, you know, land protectors, land guardians, you know, how do we conduct our business uh, um, uh, in, in regard to uh, any aspect of the commodified lifestyle, right? Uh, or do we stop looking at it in that way? and start realizing that, you know, this isn't about conducting business, this is about cultivating relationship. And that shift away from, uh, you know, how am I gonna conduct my business um, uh, or, you know, perform these tasks, uh, shifting that to how am I going to nurture and cultivate and deepen this relationship uh, will answer any question that you have because then, then the answers rise up naturally. Thank you so much for that. I'm seeing a couple questions that really touch on who you would recommend we be reading or how you recommend we continue learning uh, more about what you're sharing today. Like what, what could that look like for folks listening today? Goodness gracious. Um, 
Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, pretty much everybody's read Braiding Sweetgrass or Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, which is just stunningly beautiful. And um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there's some there's some good work out there by uh, and not all of it is in book form. Some of it's in journals, uh, but I'll give you the names of three people who I think you should be reading. Uh, certainly from this territory, uh, Dr. Darren Ranko uh, is one of the leading experts on uh, climate and culture. Uh, he is probably one of the you know he's. A local treasure and he's one of the most esteemed climate scholars on the planet um, and he has a lot of really amazing journal articles um, that are out there available for people to read especially as uh, it pertains to this territory uh, he looks at environmental impacts on indigenous populations based on uh, all kinds of factors of environmental justice and climate change uh, so Dr. Darren Ranko is somebody, and it's R-A-N-C-O, his last name. Uh, the other person uh, that I would recommend is Kyle White, uh, and Kyle's last name is W-H-Y-T-E. Uh, Kyle is also somebody who is just a prolific scholar uh, on issues of land and environment and cultural impacts. Um, and uh, then... Um, D, uh, Dina Gilio Whitaker, um, and it's G-I-L-I-O hyphen Whitaker, W-H-I-T-A-K-E-R. Um, she has she has a wonderful book out. I think she's working on another one too right now. But those three people, I think, are, are ones who should um, definitely be researched, read, contemplated, considered, uh, you know, in addition to Robin's work. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a number of scholars that contributed to some of the ideology that's in Braiding Sweetgrass. And, um, you know, I wish that they were um, more properly credited in the work and that their work had been given a lot more attention because it's, it's really a, it's a, a culmination of a number of different ideas that came from a number of people over over time that was kind of coalesced into that, into that book. And I know that there's a lot of other native scholars whose work is included in there. Um, but, you know, right now off the top of my head, those, those three. So if you look at Dr. Darren Ranko, Kyle White, and uh, Dina Gilio Whitaker, um, those three have some really great stuff out there. Thank you. And, and of course you should read this. Yes, all we can save. Truth, courage, and solutions for the climate crisis. You are a contributor in this book, right? These I are all, yeah. all. Can you share a little bit about the book? Um, well, I I have um, been working with some of the folks, uh, product uh, project drawdown, and also with the Omega Institute Center for Sustainable Living for a number of years. And one of the editors of that book, Catherine Wilkinson, was the vice president of the Project Drawdown. Uh, she was the one who essentially put the book together. She did uh, all of the copy editing for it and, um, you know, did a ton of the work pulling it together. Um, and, um, and so we had noticed um, in the work that we've been doing, because I also have, you know, trained a number of really large NGOs that are right on the front line, very well known. Uh, in regard to climate change and conservation work, who um, are, uh, you know, been part of this uh, good old boys network that has been established. And there was a real exclusion of women's voices um, other than in a, you know, pat you on the top of the head and aren't you cute kind of way, um, you know, and, and we found that many of us, despite having pretty impressive credentials, <laughs> Uh, we're getting a little ladied all the time. And then when the serious discussions happened, it was the men, right? And so what this book is, all we can save, is it's just this rallying call by matriarchs uh, within the climate movement 
from frontline activists to climate scientists at NASA and Columbia University, Harvard, um, and uh, it's it's essays and poems and um, you know research uh, reports about the work about climate change and so. Uh, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis, and it's written by all women, and um, it's fantastic. I, I read something from it every single day, and um, it's it's a something that I'm incredibly proud of. I'm incredibly proud of being a part of that. Um, there's an also there's also a new one that I contribute contributed to that's coming out, um, or maybe out right now and it's called um, Resetting Our Future. And what that book is, is it is um, a report out on the work that was done by 150 people um, in response to the UN ACE program, which is, um, you know, climate education framework. And so, um, we all contributed to that, uh, the ACE US framework, US national framework under that uh, ACE program uh, being done. And for everyone that contributed, there is a number of uh, quotes and suggestions um, uh, that are offered in, in this book. And so um, the title of it at the top, you can barely see, it says, uh, Resetting Our Future and it's empowering climate action in the United States. Uh, that's also a good one because it talks about, um, you know, looking at climate action from a ground up, grassroots sort of uh, framework and uh, putting the money into the hands of those people who are most impacted, who have the best knowledge about how to mitigate or adapt uh, in those circumstances. And so, um, the, there are some things that I've been working on, but I somehow ended up contributing to four different anthologies in 2020. And so some of my own personal writing projects got kind of pushed to the back burner. And I'm, you know, like now trying to cook them really quickly without scalding them now that they're back on the front burner. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that we also need to really, uh, you know, look at um, some of the things that are happening in relation to uh, the um, powerful reach that's happening right now towards traditional ecological knowledge, because um, you know it's a it's a very precarious position to be in because we recognize that there are uh, you know scientists and others who are grasping for traditional ecological and traditional indigenous knowledge right now. Um, and traditional indigenous ecological knowledge that's often just referred to as TEK. Um, however, the, you know, the danger in that is that um, that's happening because people are realizing that indigenous peoples have often have uh, millennia worth of data, right? Um, so we have all of this data uh, passed down through our oral traditions and through our traditional teachings about how to live in relationship with the land in a specific place. Uh, we also know our landscape so well uh, because of these millennia long relationships that we have, like the Penobscot people, we were never pushed off our homeland. You know, they say that we live on a reservation, but it's, those are our traditional homelands. We were never removed from our place of origin. Our peoples are dated, you know, in this, in this place at least 13,000 years, we believe it's been much longer. Archaeological evidence places us here uh, 13,000 years. And, um, and so, you know, we have a long relationship with this land. So we understand that changes in the landscape have broad implications on the entire ecosystem. And so that's the same with others around the world who have lived in long relationship. <coughs> uh, Australian Aboriginal population uh, you know, some of those communities, um, you know, and we believe we have the same type of, of uh, longevity here, but they have archaeological evidence going back 65,000 years of them being in the same place. And when you have that kind of relationship with that kind of depth, right, and, and breadth of knowledge that comes with living in close relationship, 
Uh, I mean, you live with somebody for a month and you know a lot about them that, you know, the rest of the world doesn't know. So imagine living in relationship with the beings of the natural world in your territory for 60,000 years. You're going to recognize that uh, like the people up in the Northern Territories have that when, uh, you know, uh, when the stars come out, if a star is, is in a different place in relation to a land, you know, a landmark. Uh, on the horizon, and that means that there's something fundamental that's changed, right? Uh, in, in my book, Sacred Instructions, I talk about the dance of the cannibal giant and the quickening, right? Uh, those are stories that tell us about the times that we're living in. And then, you know, scientific uh, evidence comes out that says, uh, we've just discovered that the world is turning faster. We can't figure out why that's happening, right? And so we have stories for all of this stuff. Um, that uh, that's based on data collection over millennia. Um, and uh, we have to be careful that that information is not used to dispossess us of control over our lands. Um, because I see that as being the next step where um, they say, you know, 80% of the most pristine places left on the planet are in the hands of indigenous peoples. We absolutely have to protect those, those lands. Uh, the only way we're going to protect them is if we take control of them, right? We meaning world governments. And so, uh, you know, some of the work that I'm doing with Nia Taro and with others um, is uh, uh, really connected to creating that understanding of that mindset. I'm, I'm doing trainings right now for um, the global staff for Conservation International and, and really having a, a deep awareness of what the risk factors are connected to the grab for traditional ecological knowledge and how the next logical step based on the trajectory of our historical knowledge of our, the relationships between in, uh, indigenous peoples and uh, these colonial governments is uh, the taking of those lands. And so um, that's worrisome because climate change mitigation and adaptation policies and techniques have thus far been related to moving indigenous populations who are living in harmonious, balanced relationship with their lands, uh, the mitigation and adaptation strategies have been moving those indigenous peoples from that way of life, that sustaining life, that has allowed for indigenous peoples to have the last remaining pristine places on earth and moving them into a market economy, which we know is what's killing the planet. And so, uh, you know, I think being aware of all of those things, gathering all of the knowledge that you can gather about that stuff uh, the three people that I that I recommended certainly have written about some of this stuff. I've written about some of this stuff um, uh, in in this essay. I wrote about it, and I also um, Dr. Renko and I just did a, a keynote speech for the um, Global Council for Science and the Environment, and we're going to be teaching now a four part series for them. And we're going to bring in Dina. We're going to bring in Kyle. We're also going to bring in. Linda Tahiwa Smith from uh, New Zealand uh, to talk about decolonizing methodologies and about best practices. So, um, you know, there's just a lot of, of things that people could be looking at and reading and understanding out there. I could go on for days, but I'll stop. Thank you. Well, we have um, many, many more questions coming in than we are gonna be able to address today. But one, one thing we'd really like to hear you speak on uh, as our closing question for you is that we as an organization, you know, compared to 65,000 years of history are, are but a blink, but we are celebrating our 50th uh, year this year. And one thing we are doing over the months is really trying to do some future scouting as Adrienne Marie Brown talks about uh, really getting clear imagining the future and trying to name the vision of where we might go. And so that we can all sort of collectively move that way. And we're wondering if you might be able to imagine 50 years in the future or, or 65,000 if you feel so called, but you know, what does what does a thriving future look like to you in your boldest imagination? What, what is happening? And can you share some of that for us so that we can hold that in mind as we move forward? Well, I think that um, 
you know, I, I'm doing this um, very quiet visioning with a group of women um, from the Wabanaki nations on what we want our our nations and our communities to look like in the future. And we're actually uh, having conversation about that. Um, and uh, then, you know, we'll, we'll decide on one image uh, that we are really thinking about and that we think is really important. And we'll all, we're all agreeing to like pray and meditate on that at the same time every day. And um, I think that one of the things that, um, is most important is to remember that what needs to happen the most is for there to be a fundamental change in the hearts and minds of human beings, that we are the only species that is out of balance with the rest of life. And every other imbalance is an adaptation or mitigation to the harm that we have caused. And so any visioning going forward really needs to be about how can we be more cooperative and collaborative um, with one another? How can we uh, invest our time visioning uh, how humans can be in better relationship with the earth? How can we um, really begin to think about um, what is different in us as human beings? that allows for us to uh, stop thinking about ourselves as either a commodity or a consumer uh, and, and places us back within uh, proper balance with the rest of life. And so um, when, when we're thinking about visioning, uh, I, I really just encourage, you know, unless we have time to really do some of that together, uh, it's not a soundbite answer. And so um, you know, the thing that I just would encourage people to think about is the fact that it's us that needs to change, right? Um, and how do we uh, actually create space for that movement, not only in ourselves, but in others? Uh, and look at all the ways that we're contributing to the division and the disharmony that's going on. Uh, in my book, I talk about the 80-10-10 rule. And so... Um, you know, we need to look around and see what's wrong. We need to be able to, to do that, right? But we need to invest 10% of our time in that. And then we need to invest another 10% of our time in stopping the flow of harm that's coming towards us collectively. There are people right now at line three in Minnesota who are giving 100% of their time to that, right? Um, but collectively, it's a drop in a bucket because they need a ton more support out there. Um, and, and this is not about just the destruction of this one place. This is systematically going on across the country. These pipelines could go anywhere, but they're purposely being put through indigenous territories as a mechanism for destroying indigenous rights, for destroying indigenous land bases, for uh, destroying indigenous sovereignty, so that industry has a much easier time doing whatever it is that they want. We are the last line of defense. Uh, and so everybody needs to be standing up with us. And so when, when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about 10% seeing what's wrong, 10% standing in the path of harm and stopping it from coming forward. And then 80% of our collective time uh, as a species, truly visioning and taking corresponding steps in the real world to make that vision a reality. So. Um, you know, think about the ways that we can change ourselves as human beings to bring ourselves back into alignment with the rest of life, put ourselves back into pro proper perspective within the larger scheme of creation so that we're not falsely believing we're somehow elevated from other living beings. Um, to me, that's what's most important. And, um, you know, I could go on and we could talk about specifics, but I think that, um, that's really going to be a discussion that's going to need to be a localized discussion uh, amongst those who are doing that work because everybody has a different piece of work um, that they're doing right now, so. Thank you for that. I love that idea of 80, 10, 10, <laughs> thinking about how to balance our energies collectively, especially. Mm -hmm. Sherry, I 
I so appreciate your teachings here today. And I just see the chat live, lively, um, (laughs) showing up with so many questions and gratitude. I'm, I'm wanting to offer you just, you know, a little bit of space. If you want to say anything in closing before we complete our time together today. I I just want to thank you all, um, for those who invited me to have this conversation to those who I've had the pleasure of meeting, who I know are doing really important work. I think that um, it's really critically important for us to um, be looking at what other people are doing um, and to to see it in a way that uplifts the beauty of it uh, and uh, that avoids the toxicity of cancel culture. Um, And so, you know, I've seen so many uh, beautiful people who have been doing work for years and years and years, uh, and it's become a te- their life has become a testament to, um, you know, this healing uh, work, and uh, seeing others who are you know rising up like popcorn right now who are uh, doing their best to 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 discredit them and dismantle uh, the work that they're be- they've been doing because they you know they don't. They haven't done their own work. And so um, be careful of that as you're moving forward and stay united and continue to see the beauty in one another. Because one of the things that I think um, this time has not allowed for is our our, uh, belief that people can change. And so uh, the only way that we're going to be able to cycle forward as a species and continue to live is if we actively create space for movement for those who are, um, you know, what we perceive as being in opposition to us. Uh, And that doesn't mean that we just allow anything to go, right? That doesn't mean that there are two sides to every issue. Uh, What that means is is that we have to be careful of getting locked into the binary um, that, uh, you know, perfection is, uh, you know, the enemy of progress, right? And so, Uh, We have to make sure that we're allowing space for uh, people to move and for movement to occur. Something doesn't have to be absolutely perfect in order to be better. And right now, what we need to focus on is is being better together. And so I I just want to acknowledge you. I want to uplift you in my heart and thank you for the work that you're doing out there in the world. And um, I want to encourage you all to just see the beauty and look for ways that you can cooperate and collaborate and build community uh, in, in healthy ways. And, and we're all learning that and relearning that together because we've been living in such a toxic way for so long. So, um, you know, I just, I just want to encourage you all to stay, stay heart centered uh, as you're going forward and, and to stay deeply, deeply rooted uh, in the earth and, and not get caught up in, in too much of the division, um, but also don't back down from, uh, you know, standing in that protective stance against tyranny because we, we really need to, to be doing both. So uh, thank you all very much for having me and, and I wish you the best as, as you go forward over the next month with all of the things that you're gonna be doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sherry. I hope you're taking in here in the chat just so much gratitude for what you've been willing to share with us today and for being the the grounding, the foundation of our time together. It's really, really helpful to start with the intention, as you're saying, in uh, asking what others are doing and up really holding ourselves to be committed to the beauty and celebrating that, be committed to collaboration and coordination and movement together. You know, this idea that perfection is the enemy, let's just try to be better and be together is is huge. And I think a really helpful message to lead us into the conversations we're gonna be having over the coming month. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you all. And, 
This is going to be the end of our time together here on the first day of the Winter Conference. Thank you all to those of you who have been, have spent your Sunday afternoon with us. We hope that you will um, take a peek at that, at that large email that you've gotten. Um, it should have links to workshops, roundtables, and next weekend's keynote panel as well. So don't hesitate to reach out again, Livy at nofavt.org with any questions about the conference. And if you have uh, the thoughts, feelings, follow up, please reach out. We, we think this is just the beginning of our conversation, not the end. Thank you for being here today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.